Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. And my guest today is going to be Mr. Dennis Fox. I'll tell you about him in just a moment. Uh, you might notice if you're watching the video that um, my attire is a little different than normal. Uh, for I don't know how many months I've been wearing, uh, I usually wear a blue shirt uh, when we do these interviews. But uh, down here in South Florida, we've had been in a cold snap uh, Sunday morning. Our temperatures were in the low 40s. Actually, here in our community, Coral Springs, I think it reached 38, which for South Florida is pretty darn cold. So um, plus, I'm uh, because of this illness I was de- I've been dealing with the past couple of years. I am hypersensitive to the cold because of my thyroid being a little screwed up. So yes, I'm dressed uh, for a little. Uh, warmer feels so I can sit here and do this podcast without having icicles hang down from my mustache and my beard. So we are glad to have you. And my guest today is Dennis Fox, as I mentioned. He had intended to join the ranks of, well, most of the audience of this podcast, which is he wanted to be a firefighter. But it ended before it began due to a back injury on the job as he was working his way through college. Now, when he was looking, he was in school, I had been about in for about a year. So we're not that far apart age-wise and what we know, what we've learned growing up in that time frame. Um, he, has, he currently runs antelope sprinkler repair and dryer vent cleaning. Uh, but prior, uh, and he still works with this in, in, a, in, a, in a fashion, starting in April 2015, Dennis became a supporter of the effort to ban and recall ionization smoke Uh, smoke alarms. He has the website www.smokealarmsafety.org, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. Since learning of the hidden dangers of ionization alarms in April of 2015, he has been creating public awareness in the effort to warn the public about the dangers of these iron alarms and calling for a ban that these dangerous and often deadly devices across the world. Uh, He is a webmaster in public relations uh, was the webmaster of public relations for firecrusade.com. It's no longer available from November 2015 to August of 2016. Designed and launched www.smokealarmsafety.org in September of 2016. He published an ebook titled Ion Empire in April of 2018. A new, a new ebook is available and proceeds from the sales of Ion Empire will help spread the message worldwide and save millions of lives over time. We'll put the uh, link for the book, his ebook, on the sh- in the show notes as well. So you can order it if you are so inclined. A story of fraud and corruption and negligent homicide, possibly, in America and worldwide. The Ion Empire was written to help create public awareness to the billions of people at risk of smoke slash fire deaths and injuries due to the use of ionization smoke alarms and other consumer questionable practices warned about in the uh, in the, his ebook the killer injury and place lives at risk globally every day. Dennis, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad we're finally able to reschedule and pleasure to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about um, initially how you found out about a problem uh, with the uh, ionization uh, smoke alarms. Well, uh, yet again, I was working for ADT, the home security company. I had done that on and off since 1997 in between my own businesses. I had just sold or got out of the trucking business I was in for six years and I went back to ADT and I'm on the National Fire Protection Association website and I was just updating my fire statistics because I told people the worst thing you could have is a fire in your house without a smoke alarm, a monitored smoke alarm. You know, I didn't try to scare them about how many burglaries there are and that kind of thing. And uh, I accidentally clicked a blog about ionization smoke alarms. I never heard of an ionization smoke alarm. This is about seven years ago. And I'm like, what is this guy talking about? He was a former firefighter in Australia. And I'm like, how could this be possible that they sold a smoke alarm that doesn't detect smoldering smoke? I'm like, this is crazy. 
So I looked up his website, the World Fire Safety Foundation dot org, and he had all these fire chiefs and fire unions backing him to get rid of these ionization alarms in Australia. It took him 15 years to get him recalled or or banned in Queensland, Australia. Just one territory in Australia, about 5 million or so people in that territory. All the others, they're in the back pocket of the fire club, as I like to call it, which Richard Patton, who actually exposed this in 1976, called the fire club. Everybody involved that supports ionization alarms and failed to get them recalled, manufacturers and, you know, the people who approved them, the agency that approved them, the company. And um, so I'm like, this is insane. I mean, how could it be going on this long, you know, and how could I have not heard about it? I mean, ADT only sold uh, photoelectric heat alarms. They wouldn't touch ionization alarms. The liability, they knew the companies were getting sued that made them. Uh, plus, it would overwhelm their monitoring stations morning, noon, and night every time someone cooked. And so, you know, they wouldn't touch them. As a matter of fact, in 1977, a year after Richard Patton exposed this consumer fraud for the ionization alarms, they went on a $3 million ad campaign for the photoelectric technology. But by the time I started working for them, it was all about the app and how you can lock your door with your phone and that kind of thing. And they didn't mention it. It was in the sales book that they were photoelectric with a heat sensor, but not one mention to the sales reps and the sales managers at all. So I was really shocked when I came across this blog and so I looked up uh, the World Fire Safety Foundation and uh, the founder, Adrian Butler, he was a former firefighter himself. He had started a uh, security company himself and he was getting all these complaints about ionization alarms going off in the kitchen all the time and not going off when it should and smoldering smoke. And so he told me to get a hold of Richard Patton, who happened to live just a town over from where I did. And so I got a hold of Richard and I said, you know, this story is just incredible. I mean, it's just mind blowing. And I'd like to buy you lunch and hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, because he was the one who exposed it all after he got a hold of what they call the Dunes Report. Uh, test, Dunes test. So it was a government test about five years after uh, they became mandatory. Okay. So unfortunately, the government hired the UL techs uh, to do this report. And so um, as a result, he got a hold of this report and he realized something's not right here. Something is definitely not right. They made it look like heat detectors were worthless, which is not true. Heat detectors are very good. They, they use them for fire sprinklers. Um, and uh, so... Well, they use them. I mean, they're good for that when it, when it works. But the fact is that we don't want to wait for somebody to be uh, roused uh, by... Um, by you know waiting for the heat sensor to go off it's more we always that's one of the things that you know we promoted have promoted through the fire service is that smoke alarms uh initially were being put out outside of bedroom rooms because we wanted the people to be aroused or hear the bar before smoke or the poisonous gases gets into the room so they can make an exit so while the heat yeah. The heat, def heat, this heat sensor in and of itself was worthwhile for heat. That was not the ideal that anybody in the fire service wanted to see, see because it would be the, that 
you know, maybe if you were sitting in the den after having dinner, that would work all well and good. But if you're sound asleep at two o'clock in the morning and you're waiting for your heat sensor to go off, that could be too late. Yeah. Well, well, that said, that's why you need a combination of photoelectric right. and heat. The advantage of heat over ionization is you don't have the nuisance alarm problem. So in the kitchen when you're cooking, it's not going to go off and, you know, when there's just like light smoke, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and photoelectric don't go off with real light smoke either. Uh, you know, so anyhow, that said, the ionization was made out to look better than a heat detector and a photoelectric, both. They made it look like, and they advertised them as the best technology available and made claims like they would detect the smoke before there was, it was even visible and that kind of thing. Okay, so they made some false advertising way back in the 70s about these things. And they were cheaper to make. That's why they went to the extent they did. They were cheaper to make. The manufacturers were going to save millions of dollars making the ionization alarm that only cost a dollar versus two to 250 for a photoelectric. You know, it's funny you mention it that way because there is a brand name of the bandage we put on our fingers and cuts and stuff like that out there. Big, big name, been for years. And if you remember, if you bought those and you want to open up a pack, a little pack with a Band-Aid in it, there was a red string, right? And you'd pull that red string and it would rip the paper down. You could take it out, take the bandage out. Well, several years ago, I purchased one and I noticed the red strings were gone. And I said, why would they re get rid of red strings, especially on the larger Band-Aid, because it's easier to take out. And um, it turned out they stopped using the string because it was less money not to use the string yeah. and let the consumer open it up. All right, so in that case, it's not a danger. You're just kind of surprised growing up as long as we did with the other type, all of a sudden to, you know, just within the last couple, few years, that change. But that change doesn't affect the 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 uh, capabilities of that bandage. And of course, you also have your responsibility of keeping it sterile. You know, that's that's on the user, but the bandage still works. What we're hearing now about these ionization is that, yeah, they were advertised, but they weren't doing the job that we had all hoped them to do. Failure rate was over 50% in the test, the Dunes test. It would take over an hour for most of these ionization alarms to activate. Okay, you're talking smoldering smoke so thick we couldn't see each other or your hand in front of your face. And, uh, you know, there, there's a news video on my website, smokealarmsafety.org. Uh, Boston Fire Chief uh, Jay Fleming, he's been trying to get these things uh, recalled for probably 30 years now. And he had to settle for mandatory photoelectric uh, legislation in Massachusetts because he the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission basically ignored all his letters. Uh, then at the time, uh, the last letter he sent, they ignored him and he was rubbing elbows with the Senator John Kerry at the time, John Kerry sent a follow-up letter to the Consumer Product Safety Commission saying, what is going on here? This is a no-brainer. If they're not working, why are they still being sold on and on and on? And they thanked him for his letter, but still ignored uh, Chief Fleming. Just ignored him completely. Um, and so... He settled for photo uh, electric legislation in Massachusetts, five, uh, four other states, Ohio, Iowa, and a couple of uh, Vermont, um, and I think Maine, or one other anyway, five uh, total. Some, uh, some places in California uh, do the effort of 
Chief Mark McGuinn. He was a uh, firefighter uh, chief in Alameda, California. They got their county to have mandatory uh, photoelectric. And then Sebastopol, I think Palo Alto, a few other municipalities. But he tried to get these other, you know, fire departments involved in California, some other fire chiefs. But there's there's an issue with some of the, you know, their response was, it's our job to fight fires, you know, more or less was their attitude. Um, you know, they just didn't get involved. And right. that's the case for, you know, 45 other states, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah well, uh, you know, one of the things yeah. we know, uh, you and I have discussed off air, of course, but we've we've discussed the fact that uh, you know, very recently, uh, only in the last few years in the fire service, uh, did we learn that the very bunker gear we've been wearing since the mid '70s, which is when I joined, and you were you were supposed to join, um, yeah. But yeah. the gear that we have, um, and the waterproofing in parts of that gear, was made with what what are now referred to as forever chemicals. And yeah, yeah. it is still in our gear today, all these years, you know, uh, it's, yeah. it's been in our gears longer than I was in the fire service. And at the same time, uh, during my time, my eight years before I got hurt, I was wearing that bunker gear, carrying it in my car, carrying it, it having it in my house by the steps, by the front door, in case I had to go. And we never thought twice about putting on the gear because it was there to protect us. Yet, right. yet, nevertheless, not only the, back then were we dealing with these chemicals, but of course we didn't know back then about the uh, the carcinogenic properties of many of the things that burn. And of course, right. back then, as you and again, as you and I have talked, because we our, our ages are not that different. That back in those days, that furniture was made of real wood, and uh, Stuffing in furniture was usually from kapok trees, and we did not have what we would call today um, benzene, uh, you know, side products, byproduct in almost everything in our homes. And of course, because of that, even the incipient stage of fire, which maybe in those days were four to seven, we're lucky if we get three to four minutes today from the time of a fire starts to the time it explodes uh, beyond, yeah. you know, simple, simple dousing. And we have to big So a lot of this, and again, you know, from what we've learned through the attorney representing and, and uh, multiple uh, cases that have been filed against manufacturers is that these chemicals were created by a couple of the major manufacturers back in the 50s. Apparently, what we've heard is that they knew they could be carcinogenic, and they also knew that they would never break down. They, for them, that was the the, uh, the magic lantern because, well, if the products never break down, we don't have to create anything new because this stuff works and it'll work forever. Oh, yeah, well, it might be carcinogenic, which was really, I don't even know if that was a term back in the 50s when this stuff was made, but let's you call it poisonous to the human body. And of course, we found out uh, over the last uh, five to seven years or so uh, what those things are. But now we're more careful. You know, m most departments, career, volunteer, a wildland, uh, uh, urban interface, et cetera, now are very, you know, we wear uh, self contained breathing apparatus or special respirators. We make sure we wear our gear all the time, even when we're doing overhaul, when the fire's out, we still have to take down parts of walls and ceilings to make right. sure they're not spread. And we're wearing our gear full time because we also have learned medically that when we sweat, which we're going to do in any fire situation, you could be fighting fire at 10 below zero. You're still going to sweat on the inside and our oh, pores absolutely. open up and that allows those carcinogens to gives them a better avenue to get into our body. So I really, right now, I think we can, we can see that 
uh, a lot of these corporations, whatever they are or were making, are putting the dollar sign above the welfare of the end user. And and doing that for decades. Right. And look, at these two industries are not the only ones. Okay. And we'd be, we'd be fools nope. and we'd be lying if we said they were. So we know that, you know, we have chemical, you know, as we, you, again, we've talked about, based on both of these, we've talked about the water pollution in West Virginia. And we have, and now we're seeing uh, the water pollution at our military base, military and air force bases across the country, both from uh, dumping of fuel and the use of AFFF or aqueous film forming foam, which we use a lot in my first department. Um, uh, uh, my chief then was a, a specialist in flammable liquid fires. Uh, luckily, I just never wound up getting splashed with it at all. So I never had any, yeah. you know, skin contact with the liquid, but that was just my luck. Um, even though I was a, you know, top eight responder in this volunteer de- department, I just lucked out and thank my, thank, you know, good Lord above that I was, you know, I, I wasn't at risk for it from that experience, but I still was wearing that gear and carrying it all around with me. Right. Um, and that, real, you know, real quick, real I'm quick, sorry, Pete, just yeah. a, for your viewers who want the story about these forever chemicals, they want to see the Brockovich report. Right. Karen Brockovich, we right. all know. Yeah. She, and she yeah. is working with our lead attorney um, on, on these cases. Yeah. And, and yeah. thank God for that because, you know, she um, and even the, uh, the head of nuclear uh, science at Notre Dame University has d- did the tests um, thanks to the housewife of a firefighter from Worcester, Mass, yeah. who was diagnosed with cancer. And she couldn't understand why, you know, he had prostate cancer. And yeah. the examination yeah. of the gear, of our bunker gear, not only his, but then both new and used, dating back to 76 or 77 forward, they found the forever chemicals in every single set of gear they tested. Even, yeah. 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 So that, and, and the fact that uh, she and her, and the firm that she worked for came on board was a big, big help to get yeah. the word out. And uh, I think yeah. well, her, that her, was her report, the, her report reveals the companies who made these things, yeah. their own testing showed. Oh, that yeah. they were yeah, toxic they, they, and carcinogenic. They, 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 and there's a movie. There's a movie that was made uh, called Dark Waters. Yeah, that was about the water in West Virginia, correct? And that was a company that just dumped all their effluent into the river. No, no yeah. qualms, no, no weights, no concerns. Yeah, just yeah, dump yeah. it there. Who'll know? And now, like ninety percent of people have these forever chemicals in their blood. Not just in this country, around the world. More so, likely. almost eight billion people, and over ninety percent of us have this. And newborn babies in the yeah, last two horrible. years, newborn babies are born with PFAS in their bloodstreams. Yeah, the IAFF is now involved in disputing the tests that they're using. Oh yeah, they they voted. You know, um, they, they claim they they are not admitting that it's you know. They're just trying to keep it going. Um, however, the companies are going to stop uh, manufacturing products with that stuff in yeah, it over the next three back. years. But that's like fifty years too late. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Plus the fact that you know what we're hoping for. You know, they want to charge full price for every replacement set of gear. Okay. Well, our. Uh, the the case, legal case against them is asking for damages where every current firefighter in the United States is provided with a second set of absolutely clean gear, unused yeah. gear, once the PFAS has been removed. But I think the earliest one that I saw, I believe it was last week or the week before, was going to be 2025. They, that one company was going to be able to be finished with i believe so right now again we have to note the fact that this is not necessarily on the outside of 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 the gear 
uh, which would, wouldn't have made it quite as dangerous. It still would be crappy. But the fact is that it's on the waterproofing, which is close to the, close to the, much closer to the inside of our bodies uh, where sweat can go and things like that. And, um, and it can't seep. So the outside, we're not concerned about as much as we are on that waterproofing on the inside of our bunker coats and our bunker pants that we wear. And, you know, some, some of us wear white, some of us wear yellow, some wear black, but it's all bunker gear. When you see firefighters uh, at a fire call, you're going to see them all wearing their gear. And that's the gear we wear to protect us, or as we thought until a few years ago, to protect us. And for the most part, for what we do in those fires, yes, it prevents us from a lot of the heat, uh, a lot of the smoke, but not everything. And the and then yet here we are risking our lives to save lives and property of the of the people in our communities, and yet from the inside we're being poisoned. And so it's I, I really think that these two major issues, what we're seeing with PFAS and what we're talking about with these ionization smoke detectors, are very similar and very closely related. I wouldn't call them brother and sister, but I'd certainly call them first cousins. Good. Because, yeah, I like because that. we first got the industry, we have the industries um, really trying to play down the dangers, yet we know. And, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President of your company, if, you know, you think, well, only this num number of firefighters died from cancer in a given year, but we made, uh, uh, you know, 300,000 sets of bunker gear last year. Yeah. So you made 300 more sets, th th 300,000 more sets of poisonous bunker gear last year. So yeah, yeah. let's not forget the fact that you're not going to take a bite of a blowfish in a sushi restaurant unless you know that chef knows how to remove the venom gland. Yeah. Because it might be the last bite you ever take in your life. Exactly. So exactly. we can't, you know, as as we are finding out, both here in the in the fire service over the last eight years or so. I mean, this is the seventh. We're in the seventh season of the podcast, and it was the end of 2016 where I first learned about the the cancer initiative in the fire service. So we've been fighting that since approximately then, and the PFAS is only about three years three years old, our discovery of the PFS in our gear. And mm -hmm. now we're talking about the manufacturing of these uh, smoke detectors that, you know, the fire service, you know, 1.2, 1 1.4, probably it was back then 1.4 million, but now we're, we're down 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 in the U.S. have always promulgated putting smoke detectors in your home. And in many areas around this country, fire departments will come to your home and install them for free if you purchase it. And if you can't afford smoke detects for your home, many of those fire departments will actually provide them for free for you. But the fact is, we were providing what these manufacturers were creating. And now we know, and we have this, this horrible dark cloud hovering over us as firefighters, that we could have installed these smoke detectors that did not work as advertised, did not work as promised, exactly. did not protect the citizens for all those years. And we exactly. feel... The, we, the manufacturers no. use the fire department as fire a form club. of advertising. They donated pallets of these ionization alarms to put in lower income housing. Uh, going on seven years ago, the first petition I posted on change.org was to get the Red Cross and United Way to stop installing the ionization smoke alarms as well. They were putting them in lower income housing as well. Um, Rich, while I, while, I, while I remember, so I can put it in the show notes, what is the address of what you're just talking about? Um, okay, so what you can do is... Uh, it's on change.org. Change.org. The, the petition is to uh, get the Red Cross. If you do a search, Red Cross, United Way, ionization smoke alarms, and 
you know, put smokealarmsafety.org, you'll get to it. But you can also get to it by going to the link to the current petition to get uh, the attorney general offices to step in to get a recall of these alarms because the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the manufacturers have failed to do so. Right. Are these okay. links both? Are these b links both on your uh, website? The okay. So the link to the current petition is on my website. Okay. So good. when you get to that petition and hopefully sign and make a comment about it, uh, you can click my logo and see all my petitions. Okay. Okay. Great. And then you can get to the one with the, and the one with the, uh, you know, the Red Cross, it actually caught their attention finally. They were ignoring me basically before I posted the petition, sending them all this proof that these ionization alarms won't wake people up. And they just ignored it until the petition. And that petition got over 5,000 signatures. Uh, because someone who was doing that 9-11 petition, uh, John Feel of the Feel Good Foundation, right. I sent him an email or Facebook IM telling him, hey, because he had 189,000 signatures at that time. It went on to get over 500,000 signatures. He really stepped up for the first responders who were getting cancer from all that toxic smoke at 9-11. Right. Right. Okay, so he was the first one to make a comment, I believe, and one of the first people to sign it. Uh, and he shared it with all these 189,000 people. And within a, few, a day or two, two or three days, had 5,000 people sign it. And that caught the Red Cross attention. And they set up a conference call with their fire safety promotion guy. And I thought, oh, maybe this is going to, you know, be uh -oh. good. <laughs> but then he tells me, you know, these things are approved. And I said, I realize that. But they won't wake people up at night in small yeah. conditions. If you, buy a, can, well, if you buy a can opener, excuse me, if you buy a can opener, and it doesn't work and doesn't open any cans, what are you going to do with yeah. it? Okay. You're going to use yeah, it as a doorstop or you're going to return it and get your money back. Well, the fact yeah, is yeah. when these alarms don't work, you can't get your money back because if it doesn't work, no, you can't go anywhere because you're not there anymore. No, no, you can't. You can't. But their attitude was more or less the cost. They said, you know, Photoelectric or cost more money and we're on a budget kind of thing. I mean, they bring in $4 billion a year in donations. I mean, and so I told them, well, you know, if you buy them in bulk, you know, you can bring the cost down probably close to, you know, what ionizations are, you know, the right. more you buy, the less money they are. Yeah. And yeah. so he says, well, the, you know, those might be coming from China. He had a reason for not doing it. And no matter what I said, yeah. they weren't going to do it. They never planned to do it. The conference call was just a, you know. A show. A, yeah, I mean, honestly. And this this has, you know, been the case over the la last seven years. I've contacted people I thought for sure, organizations I thought for sure were going to do something, at least warn people, you know, uh, every burn unit hospital in the U.S. I contacted, and only one responded, uh, a burn unit nurse responded and said, oh, I'll pass this on to the board of members. And I thought, okay, great, you know. But then the board of members got back to me and told me, oh, we take the recommendation of the ABA, American Burn Association. And they totally ignored me, the ABA. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that was basically it. That was as far as they went. And just recently, I was on the ABA website. There's no mention of smoke alarms at all. It's all prevention about other things. Yeah. Not one mention of a smoke alarm when you do a search on their site. You know. And so I was like, wow, that's strange. But anyway, long story short, uh, the only one of all the organ 
organizations I contacted, and this was early on. This is when I first found out about it. The National uh, Safety Council, I believe, they were, you know, serious about doing something because they were just recommending a working smoke alarm at the time. And I told them everything they needed to know why they should be recommending photoelectric and photoelectric heat combo alarms. Um, but they still went with the recommendation of the others, you know, yeah. the fire club, which is for best protection, use photoelectric and ionization alarms. Okay. That's been the case. They never used to do that until a lawsuit, you know, which involved one of the parties of the fire club. They were sued for not disclosing the danger. They were the ones who approved this thing. Okay. And they didn't disclose the danger. So they were involved with a lawsuit uh, with First Alert, BRK, who, you know, I, I, it was after that, that's when they started recommending using both. They were supposed to, I believe, according to an attorney I spoke to, they were supposed to put a warning label. They never put a warning label on these things. That they won't wake you up when you're asleep in smoldering smoke conditions. No yeah. warning label. And, and Dean Dennis, okay, who lost his daughter in a dorm fire, and you can watch the video presentation they made. Uh, Dean Dennis, along with the Northeastern uh, Fire Protection Association, the president of the IAFF now is Edward Kelly. He sat right next to Dean in this presentation, and they, they don't show him what he was saying he said he said his you know part but it's mostly just being given the presentation yeah. Yeah. okay and he showed proof and all these young children uh you know who died of smoke inhalation in fact at the end of part two the chairman of the board says oh mr dennis that's concerning that these Children are dying uh, with no fire damage and just smoke inhalation. And you thought, okay, they're going to do something. They're going to do the right thing and recall these things, which he recommended. He got his foot in the door with his petition on change.org to require mandatory uh, warning labels. That's how he got his foot in the door. They didn't even do that. They didn't even put a warning label. And they sure as heck didn't recall them Probably, like they right. strongly suggested. Everyone, yeah. the National Northeastern Ohio group, uh, you know, and they they just pretty much you get, you had to wonder what in the heck did they even invite them for? It's it's like the conference call with the Red Cross, right? They right. were just, you know, and so what they ended up doing is they put it up for both whether or not they should add smoldering smoke material to the smoldering smoke test that they've been using for 50 years, which was nothing that had smoldering material. They took dried out pine sticks, put them on a hot plate at over 700 degrees, and called it a day for the next 50 years. They never de detected yeah. smoldering smoke. You I mean, know, how, this is just unbelievable. But, when, but it's true. It's true. Yeah, that's the sad, that is the sad part, that it is true. And, you know, you, it boils down to the old adage, when you make an error, you make it one of two ways. You either make it by an error of omission, or you make the error by yeah. commission. And just like we, we know with PFAS, it was made with commission they knew what they were created they knew what they created they knew oh, what yeah. it would do they knew how it would help the fire service and they also knew that it would take a toll on the fire service but for them and as you and i have talked about it's the cost of doing business that's how they look at it all right we're That's gonna have to take a break end. right we're gonna take a yeah. quick, quick break folks 
When we come back, we're going to cont continue to talk a little bit more with Dennis Fox as we talk about the dangers of certain types of smoke detectors, how long it's been going on, and what you can do today, what to think about today. And if you're in the fire service, you know, this is important for you to know as well uh, for your communities and uh, to do more research. And hopefully when you uh, visit uh, Dennis's website, you're going to learn whatever it is you need to know to make sure that in your community, you folks are using the right and the best smoke detectors for your community to keep your citizens and their families safe. So we're going to be right back with Dennis Fox right after these words. As always, please stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. And with me today, my guest is Dennis Fox. Dennis has been, he's really running almost a one-man campaign to uh, help people to know and to learn that there's every possibility that a lot of the older, uh, the what we call an older model, of smoke detectors that use ionization did not work properly. And when a smoke detector, you know, if you light one match, okay, you light one match. But if you drop that one match into the booklet or the carton of the rest of the matches, you got quite the fire. Well, if a smoke detector doesn't work, the people who live in that abode don't have any kind of a warning that there's a fire in their home. And with no warning to wake them up maybe from a sound sleep or you're busy in the kitchen and it goes off in the garage or another room and it doesn't go off, by the time you realize what's going on, it could be too late, too late to the point where you could lose your your higher apart your apartment, your home, or someone could lose their life. And that's just a fact of what happens when fires occur in livable spaces. We either know about it and we do what we can to get out, get out safely, get everybody out, or the alternative. And Unfortunately, according to Dennis's research and all the work he's done to it, and Richard Patton, who broke this story, would you say, over 30 years ago, right? Richard well, broke the. That was Jay Fleming, who's been in it about 30 years, right, but, trying to get him recalled. Right. Richard Patton's the one who exposed it first in the U.S. in 1976. All right, so it's over 40 years. So over 40, 40 years. Over 46 years. Over 46 years. Exposed. Right, 77. That's yeah. when I got in the fire service. So for, over 46 years. And no one wants to take responsibility for it. And that's concerning. It should be concerning to everyone. You don't have to be in the fire service to be concerned about this issue. Because we are the first responders, and we have always, at least going back to 46 years when I started, we have always promoted the idea of using smoke detectors in every home, whether it's an apartment, whether it's a battery or electric one. Change, you know, we, we've had for many years the Change Your Clock, Change Your Batteries program across all 50 states, okay? And it's because we need to make sure that you are alerted to the point where even if you're sleeping, you're alerted that there is danger in your home from fire or smoke or both. So, Richard, and let me let me add go real ahead. quick. Go uh, ahead, Richard. Steve. I mean, like Dennis, me, I'm sorry. <laughs> like me, you had just heard about this recently, right? When, when you saw my, uh, you know, profile on. 
what is that uh, group? No. I, I forget. But right. It was just yeah. by chance that we we met by chance, yeah. not by you. And you you were, you know, in the service, fire service, what over eight, eight, about forty six years, and 40, you never heard of it. No, no, not forty. I I was only served eight years, then I got hurt. But I've ke I've been a I've kept connected with the fire service all that time. Right. Reading all the yeah. trades. But this was the first yeah, I had heard. And this was of the it. first time you heard about it. Right. Right. There, there was a story online of a retired fire chief who died of smoke inhalation because he had ionization alarms. I mean, this has been hidden so long, and they were, you know, putting them in lower income housing, and it's really not the fireman's job to know how fire uh, smoke alarms work. Their job is to protect people when there's a fire. Right. And right. there were and so many that didn't know about this that, you know, I mean, they try. I mean, back then, the Internet wasn't even up and running. Richard Patton was stamping every letter that he sent, and he sent them to every fire marshal in 1976 and 1977, or he made presentations. He did all he could with his firecrusade.com website, okay? And, you know, he's 97 now. So oh, he's, he's slowed down quite a bit. Um, he, I, I offered to update his website because uh, this was seven years ago. Because his website, you couldn't even edit because the program just wasn't working yeah, in anymore. In those days, right. Whatever. So I, I did, and then, um, you know, he, he just decided he's not going to, you know, have that website anymore. It really wasn't good for a search, you know. Uh, so I switched to smokealarmsafety.org. Right. And, and, yeah. and, that's, and I think, you know what, it's not even the name of the website it's the fact what it teaches and what it it shows and that's what people need to see they need to see yeah, yeah. the facts okay and that's the key oh, and they need yeah. to read you know you've provided me with uh in numerous emails with docs to read and stuff like that and it's yep, they're yep. very educational there's no doubt about it and you know yes yeah. do i do i feel remorse for all the smoke detectors I helped install? In some way, yes. In some way, no. In some way, no. We did it out of the goodness of our hearts to help people um, who couldn't do it on their own or couldn't afford it on their own. Yeah. So I don't feel, I'm glad that we were able to help them. But now I have to look back and say, did we help them or did we kill them or hurt them? Because that's what Many of us, especially from back that time, all retired, those who were still around, that's what we have to face because yeah. that oath protect lives and property. Well, if we put in a bad smoke detector in someone's home, was that an era of omission or commission? I think it's a little bit of both. I think the omission is the fact that we didn't have all the information because the no, manufacturers didn't. didn't want us to have it. So no we did it based on the package. Right. So we, we did it uh, in faith, the, the best that we knew that this was going to help save lives. You guys were duped just like the consumers were duped. Right. And, right. and according to that news video on my, on my website, According to uh, Chief Fleming, a third of all deaths are due to these ionization smoke alarms, which makes sense. People sure. sleep about a third of the right. time. You know, and it, so it's... over 50 years, that's hundreds. Of, uh, and burn injury. Burn injuries are five times higher than sure. the deaths. Right. And so they're getting burned as well. And so the, the numbers are hundreds of thousands, according to uh, Richard Patton. Yeah. He puts it up about 50,000 fired deaths and about uh, 
300,000 injuries because you're, you're breathing in this toxic smoke. Oh, sure. Even if you make it out of the house, that stuff is bad on the lungs. Oh, it's yeah. Well, no, doubt, no doubt about it. Yeah, we've, and, you we've, know, they, they put the firefighters at risk because sometimes it takes 30 to 60 minutes to go off. By the time the fire trucks arrive, that house is engulfed. It's, co- it's cooking, as we say. And they got to go in. Yeah. They got to go into a much more dangerous situation versus, okay, it's just the kitchen slightly got charred. Right. You know, that kind of exactly. Exactly. You know, we, and we've tried to tell people, you know, uh, teach them don't put water on an oil fire. You know, if you're frying and you did too high, don't pour water on it. We, we demonstrate that every Thanksgiving. You, every national news show on the day before Thanksgiving or on Thanksgiving morning shows has a demonstration video of a fire department under control, dropping a frozen turkey into a vat, a, a, a large pot of hot oil, spills over right. the, the thing, and then they pull a garden hose. You can't put out an oil fire with a garden hose. We teach you that every Thanksgiving holiday. But we've tried to teach you what we learned about smoke detectors. So we taught you what we knew. And now we're finding out what we knew. It wasn't that we didn't, we didn't learn enough. It is that we weren't told. We, were never, we never knew about what, how the smoke detectors worked or if they worked. And the fact that they weren't working. We had no info being fed down to us, the troops, the boots on the on the ground, who put these things in and advocated them at every booth that we held at shopping fairs and malls and things like that, and even visits to home. We do a welfare visit on a for, on an EMS patient, and I used to look around to see, oh, you don't have any smoke detectors? Would you? Well, I hadn't gotten around to. All right, we'll bring a couple by and put them in for you. Well, that's yep. what we did, and 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 there was nothing wrong with that because we were looking out for what we thought was the welfare of those people in our communities. Yeah, but and, and it, you know, it was better than nothing. I mean, let's yes, you know, yeah. having exactly. an ionization alarm is better than nothing. However, when there's a better technology, you're talking about your family safety, you know, and. Hey. We went from seatbelts to airbags, right? But f- funny you should mention airbags. There, there's a quote by a judge, and I believe it's in that uh, case, uh, you know, uh, that I mentioned earlier. The judge quotes, he addresses the court, and he says, a smoke alarm that doesn't go off in the first 19 minutes, because I think in that case, it actually went off after 19 minutes. Right. It's like an airbag that doesn't employ in 19 minutes. I mean, what good is it? Yeah. You're, you're hey, dead. You're, listen, you're pretty much going to die. A week ago yesterday, I'm cutting coming out of the driveway of a store, a local store right around the corner from my home. The woman in front of me, I'm the second car in line, but she blows on the exit, blows the stop sign. And the car coming southbound on that road, there was no way she, she would stop. Stop. She wasn't speeding because I I could I saw her coming, but there was no way she was going to be able to stop because this lady didn't cross all the way. She only went to the median break, the break in the median to go head northbound on the road. So this lady hit her. So I jumped, put my lights, emergency lights on, grabbed my BLS bag, jumped out, put on my vest, and uh, assessed the two victims and went stayed with the victim that was more seriously injured. And her airbag did deploy because she was the one who, who did the T-bone, but she wasn't speeding. But the fact was that, and she sits close to the steering wheel because she was a tiny, tiny lady. So she had a lot of chest impact and, you know, difficulty breathing and stuff like that. So I spent my time mm-hmm. checking her because the back went off. I had to check her neck. I did the whole assessment until uh, I called in 911, uh, identified myself as a former firefighter and gave them the information they related to both police and fire and the emergency squad the fire squad fire rescue that came came to the scene was right lived is right down the street from my house they know me and we were able to, to you know treat her and get her packaged and and out on her way to the hospital and then they then they 
then the set of, another rescue came by and took care of the woman who was less injured. But the fact is that that airbag, and she said, but it hurt when it were, I said, I know, I know. But just think, if the airbag didn't go off, you would have impacted on your steering wheel. You would have Ow. bent it and yeah. could have been worse. So I said, I know you're uncomfortable now. We're going to take care of you. You're going to be fine. We're going to check you out. We have rescue coming. They're going to package you up, take you out to the ER, make sure you get checked out. And if you're fine, they'll release you. But the fact is, we got to take care of you. So that's why, and that's what, that's why I said it. Because that airbag goes off. It's a shock, but it's, it does save you. There's no doubt about it. Save you in many ways. Maybe from death, yep. maybe from serious injury. The seatbelts save you when you're smart enough to put it on. And we're now, we are still on a campaign for the last several years of getting our own brothers and sisters in the fire service to wear their seatbelts. Because we've had too many accidents where there's a rollover and they're rejected. And we've lost oh, lives yeah. of firefighters. Yeah, so, yeah I you know, read a statistic on and, that. And we rotate two public service announcements uh, put out there to, for firefighters to wear their seatbelts. And we know that firefighters wearing the seatbelts have been in accidents where those seatbelts made the difference. Oh, absolutely. Where, where they it turned over, absolutely. but they were able to release themselves and let themselves down rather than being ejected from the cab. And that's the most important thing. So the same thing has to hold true for smoke detectors, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. And my, my brothers and sisters out there in the fire service and you who are buff, fire buffs and love to follow what we do. But the fact is that number one, yes, you need smoke detectors in your home, preferably a combination as Dennis has said about with a heat, a uh, heat detector and a um, photo, photo, uh, photoelectric cell. That's going to detect fire or smoke in both ways. It can detect the heat in a room or could also detect the initial smoke as it comes up. But you need them. The fact is, those are the type to get. And Dennis... And, and that, Go ahead, Dennis. That, that said, Steve... Because of the manufacturers, the major manufacturers that really control the market, you can't actually go to like Home Depot, Walmart, uh, Lowe's and find a combination photoelectric heat alarm. They're just, right, you know, you they, buy two. they wanted ionization as the main one in there right they have for and we don't 50 years. and we don't and, but so you have to really search online to find a photo heat all the major uh, home security systems like if you already have adt or uh, protection one right uh you can get them to hook up the smoke heat right now i believe and it's, it's monitored Right. Monitored I, adds an extra layer of protection. Right. Oh, absolutely. If you're not home, say, say you say you're cooking and oh, you forgot something at the store, and the wife and baby are sleeping, and you go to the store to get something, and then you have a, a fire from a grease fire. Okay, that's a bad situation. But right. if it's monitored, boom, you call nine one one or or the actually the monitoring station is going to call you first right and, and then, then you know yeah i think i have a fire get the fire department there within minutes you know that makes the difference between you know oh yeah abs absolutely and, and listen time is your worst enemy in a fire not only yours but ours absolutely. as well as firefighters it's our worst enemy so we do we have a lot more in our hands than the homeowner does. So that's why we want to get there as quickly as possible. You know, we aim, most communities try to aim for a three to six minute res maximum response time. Now it all depends. Now again, also we must add that it is a very difficult time today, post COVID massive epidemic for the fire service. We're down on enrollment and recruitment in both the career 
in volunteer departments. But I can tell you one thing from my brothers and sisters I've spoken with, from some of the best leaders in the fire service. We are not going to let that stop us. We are going to continue to answer every alarm that comes in, whether it's working fire, possible fire. We will be there. We will, one way or another, we are going to be there, and we will be there to help and assist as necessary. So never, ever yeah. delay calling the, your fire department, calling your 911 operator, uh, calling, uh, answering the uh, automatic, if you have an automatic alarm system in your home, as Den just said, from any of the major manufacturers, and you get a call from them that there's a report of a, they're getting a fire signal from your home. Yes, tell them to call the fire department for you and we'll, we'll, head, we'll head over there. We'll check it out for you. But the fact is that to do any of that, you and us have to have confidence that the system is going to work. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, this is what it boils down to, is we have a system that appears to be broken. And oh, it, is. it it should never have come to this. It should never have been, have to be a, uh, a tell-all, an expose. It should have been simply, oh, we didn't realize that when we did our testing. Let's see what we can do to fix it and make a better smoke detector that that's what it should have been well actually they knew they they rigged the test oh no no i mean they rigged we the know test. They it wasn't knew. a matter of, oh wow that didn't show up in the test they rigged the test because they wanted to sell these things without warning labels so they made the test to where it passed the test just like the photoelectric, they used the same test for both, but they didn't use anything that's smaller than the test. It, it's just right. right. And that said, that said, um, you know, I like to call it instead of speed kills, you've heard that term. Sure. Greed, greed kills. Greed kills, absolutely. It was over a dollar fifty difference to make an ionization alarm versus a photoelectric back then okay all they had to do was oh they didn't have to rig the test this was all unnecessary they could have just made the photoelectric with a heat sensor and just charge more just like they do they charge more for the ionized uh, photoelectric Electric. which is why about 90 percent of homes have ionization alarms people shop with their wallet absolutely they don't they 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 bought the ionization alarms because hey I need six of these I'm gonna save sixty bucks versus the photoelectric boom into right. the shopping cart they go right. and, so and so we they need to be better educated we you know oh, so absolutely. that today we you know this is this is what this is going to be a part of and we're going to ask that every listener if you're a firefighter again doesn't make any difference if you're a career volunteer WUI if you're a firefighter and you're listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube, we beg you, please, take this message and do something with it. Do your own research, okay? Go to the website, Dennis's website. Learn as much as you can. Check the links. Read all the information so that you're, you can make an informed decision. And if you feel the way we do, that the best protection for our citizens is a photoelectric cell along with a heat sensor, whether it's built in or even if it's separate, as long as there's a heat sensor and a photoelectric cell, you're going to, they will be safer. So please don't keep this to yourself. Please share the podcast with others and please take the information you're hearing and do something about it. Because if you and, don't and sign the petition and sign the petition, right? <laughs> sign the, sign petition. the petition and please leave a comment. The links on my website, right? The links on the website, but do something with it. Even if it's your own investigation and education, that will help because then you'll see what the situation really is. And you can become a part 
of those of us who want to see a change, who need to see a change, yeah, because yeah. this can this is easily a matter of life and death. No, there's no there's no Absolutely. gray area. You know, this is black and white, life and death. You know, Steve, like like you, when you first heard about this, okay, you just decided you knew you had to share this with people, right? Okay. Because, wow, I was involved with firefighting for 46 years, and you never heard about it. I was involved, you know, with majoring in fire science in 78, 1978, two years after this came out. Not a mention by any of the no. firefighters who taught the fire science classes. And then... um you know, then the alarm companies I worked for since 97, they never mentioned it either, which I thought was strange. As soon as I found out about it, just accidentally came across that blog, I knew right then, if I didn't know about this, how many others don't know about this? Exactly. And so I knew right away, that was my mission in life from that day on, that I had to share this with everybody. I get 200 new customers a year, okay, I have to share that with them and let them know, hey, you know, I send them the link, I explain it to them, and most of them have the ionization alarms. Yeah. The majority of them never even heard of it. I don't even recall any of my customers over the last four years since I started this sprinkler repair and uh, dryer vent cleaning. I don't think any of them ever heard about it. Uh, I've so, never, I've never even heard it discussed. I'm going to be honest. In fire circles, I had, until you contacted me, I had never ever heard about this problem. Yeah, it, it's been swept under the rug, and you know, of course, without a warning label, it, people aren't going to know. And exactly. That, that's that's intentional because they want to sell. The one that only costs less because they're making more on those. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. just greed kills. And right. this is an example of the, the fire gear is another example. Right. They could have had another alternative decades ago. Oh, absolutely. That didn't put you guys at risk, you know. And how many people are going to get cancer and have their lives shortened by this or suffer because they got to have chemo, which is a nasty treatment. Oh, oh man. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've had, I have friends who have been through it, uh, diagnosed, had to go through chemo and radiation. It's horrible. They're, they're, they're a different person when they finish, you know, but yeah. you know what? Thank God that they, they survived, you know, and they're they're alive today, but you know we yeah. have to say, but for the grace of God, they go shouldn't on. have had to gone. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've been through two. Had to gone through. I've been through two scares. Luckily, so, I'm very lucky that the oncologist that I I had met through a friend of mine who unfortunately passed away, but was using him, one of the most esteemed oncologists in our area. Um, he did not know about the firefighter cancer initiative. So when I had my first scare, I and I went to him as a patient as opposed to come, going with my friend to help interpret some of the medical terms that were being used. Um, he he said, I didn't hear about this. So I told him about it. I told him who the doctor was at University of Miami, uh, Sylvester Cancer, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Centers, who was working in South Florida specifically for the uh, cancer initiative. I had him on the on the show as well a couple of times. And it's something that is is out there, and we'll know about it. And yeah, and like you mentioned, the the firefighters uh, union back in their uh, January two thousand twenty two uh, conference uh, passed a motion to no longer accept any uh, funding from the manufacturers for for advertisements, for donations, for anything, unless and until the manufacturers remove PFAS as part of the packaging of the processing of our bunker gear and come up with 
a proven non-carcinogenic replacement. And thanks to the yeah. director of the, the uh, uh, nuclear sciences at Notre Dame, there are chemicals out there that do the same or better waterproofing job than the PFAS Absolutely. stuff does. So we know what's out there, yeah. but they, why use it? Because they've been selling this for 50 plus years already and making huge profits off the lives of firefighters who got yeah. cancer. And those who do the testing, they're getting paid by these companies and they're protecting their best interests of keeping, oh, exactly. making all that money. That's why we Trust have, a, that's why we had an independent, you know, a, a tester of eminent, you know, uh, of eminent name in, in the science field, nuclear sciences. And that's what yep. he used. He had his team work with him and they took it right down to the nuclear level. And there was no mistake. He's been, on, he's been on the show twice, right? There's no mistaking what, what, that it's there and what it is. We have to do the yeah, same yeah. thing with the smoke detectors. And uh, I'm not, we are not in any way, shape, manner, or form condemning smoke detectors. They are absolutely necessary in every home, whether you live in an apartment, you live in a condo, you live in a, a regular, regular house, you live in a mansion, you live in a castle. I don't care where you live. You need to have working smoke detectors in your home. Okay. And not just one. Yeah. All right. And don't put it right above the stove in the kitchen either. Okay. Your local fire department will be happy to either guide you or actually do the install for you when you have it. But they're happy to guide you without a doubt of where to place your smoke detectors. And as a matter of fact, the packaging will tell you where to place them as well. However, we need to make sure that you as a educated, you are an educated public consumer, that you know what's going on, that you know the facts. You don't buy rotten eggs when they're 12 days old and you can see them moldy on the shelf, okay? You don't buy things that are broken if you know they're broken. Well, you don't want to buy things that don't work, especially when your life depends on it. And if it wasn't for Richard Absolutely. reaching out to me, I mean, Dennis reaching out to me <laughs> a couple of months ago. And like he said a moment ago, as soon as he finished basically the first five minutes of his talk, I said, this has got to be on the podcast. We have got this, me get this message out. And that's what we're doing today, folks. We, I've had Dennis here to help educate you and me and me, because until till November, when we met by email, I had no idea this was going on, none whatsoever. So yeah, and we don't and want you to. You know, I really appreciate place. Steve. I really appreciate you joining this effort. I mean, it means a lot that you've been in the fire service this long, and you have your podcast, and this is going to be shared with firemen that really don't know about it or you know couldn't do anything about it really i mean unless they wanted to devote hours and months like chief mcginn uh who got his legislation passed for alameda county i believe right. it is your your firefighter friend in australia put all that time in oh uh, man richard 20, Patton, over 20 years richard Patton has put all the, this time in over almost oh, 50 man. years of his life about this. So folks, this this is not, you know, good times and 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 sweet roses. This is the dark reality of what we might be dealing with. Now, is every ionization smoke detector bad? We can't answer that question. We don't know. And the problem is if the tests aren't 100% neutral without any party having an effect on them we might have better news but the fact is that since we don't know we should go with what we do know which is that we know that photoelectric sensors and heat detectors work and they work and this the photo detector also can work with smoldering smoke it doesn't have to be billowing smoke from a whole chair is on fire those smoldering 
fumes are activated through that photo sensor array. So we're going to put in the show notes once again, Richard's uh, website. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell it to you again. Dennis's website. De I'm sorry, Dennis. I, I apologize, Dennis. I, I keep doing that because I kept looking at Richard's stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. You can go to smokealarmsafety.org. That's where you go. Smokealarmsafety.org. Educate yourself. If you're not sure what, what we're what we're saying today, I understand, and I applaud you for wanting to look into it and learn more. I just hope you will learn and take the right action. And when you do, please share it with somebody else that you care about, even your neighbor that you may not have met. Tell them, because you don't know that you just might save a life by sharing the information with someone else. And if they want to read more about the documentation, uh, the reports that Richard Patton sent to all the fire club, you know, companies, organizations, and people who are supposed to be looking out for the public safety. I mean, he sent some really good reports and they can be found on scribed scribd.com if you Hold put on. his name richard S patton S smoke alarm safety or rather oh. richard patton ionization alarms okay hold on what's the what's the scribd uh scribd.com so scribd ibd.com yeah and look so there, richard there's patton. two uh reports that will come up why america's burning and the smoke alarm fraud uh, you can read those for free. Then you have to do the free 30-day right. you know, subscription Try. and to see all the others. Right. Um, I'm actually going to add the two reports that I sent to the uh, attorney general offices in the consumer fraud complaint. I'm going to add those two to the petition. Okay. Okay. One is the Dunes test, which is how Richard discovered this test right. was rigged. And then they falsified all the, you know, everything. Allegedly, right, right. To make ionization alarms look like the best technology. And it's just completely false. Just yeah. like the statement that they're all using, use photoelectric and ionization alarms for best protection. That's false, too. A photoelectric heat sensor has way less nuisance alarms, which leads to people disconnecting the batteries. Right. Exactly. Which led to them making fire codes where you had to have a 10 year sealed battery. That's how those 10 year sealed batteries came into place because people kept taking out the batteries. They're oh, yeah. hearing them they still do. Cooking. They yeah. still do. And so in that regard, the best protection is a photoelectric heat sensor and then monitored for very best protection. Uh, for instance, Nest, they had the, best alarm over 10 years ago they came out with a split uh, spectrum uh, sensor that will discern whether it's a flaming fire okay so it will go off within seconds right within seconds and that's the best you can do right right yeah within most a of flaming the um... fire seconds within a smoke you know a few seconds it's the best technology so what they did the fire club did because they didn't want to put a warning label or recall them six and a half, over six and a half years ago, they put it up for vote and chief Fleming was one of the people who voted along with other fire protection engineers. They put it up for vote, whether or not they should add smoldering polyurethane foam cushions in the smoldering smoke test after 50 years, right. they had to vote on this. Why, why couldn't they have just done that instead or just, done that from the beginning but we know why they didn't yeah well it's, so you know. that said they they passed third they got outvoted the main manufacturers were outvoted 31 to 5 all the fire protection engineers and fire chiefs who were involved voted for the new test this is six and a half years ago the new test still hasn't been implemented right. they, they had they gave them three years to come up with an alarm that would pass. So instead of licensing 
the Nest technology that would have passed, okay, they tinkered around and before the three-year deadline, one of the manufacturers thought they had the alarm that would pass the new test. So they approved it. Two years later, it was recalled for the same reason ionization alarms should be recalled. I mean, honestly. Yeah. And then the others claimed, oh, we can't figure this out. A year extension. Okay, they COVID hit. Another year extension. And then the last extension, okay, I, I knew it was coming. I knew another extension was coming because of the recall, you know, of the one that was supposed to pass the test and that. Uh, so they give it a two-year extension claiming supply chain issues. Okay, well, guess what? Other companies, other smaller alarm companies have come out with ones that are supposedly going to pass the new test. They somehow figured it out, but these major manufacturers have not. Something's allegedly, wrong. allegedly have not. Well, they they haven't. They well, haven't come no, up that, with it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they haven't yet, and it's yeah. been six and a half years. So okay, so when that vote first came out, we thought, okay, ionization alarms aren't going to pass the test. No way, they're not going to pass, and they'll be taken off the market. So, and you know, we thought, well, that was good. But that didn't happen. And without a recall, without a recall, they're going to have a 10-year window, okay, before they actually have to buy a new alarm, okay? So they're going to be, 90% of the consumers out there are going to still be at risk for up to another 10 years once the new test kicks in and they can't buy an ionization standalone alarm. Right. Okay. So how many more people are going to die within that 10 years? Okay. Well, you know what? All we can do is educate as many as we can that the best way to go is with that photoelectric cell and heat sensor and then have it make sure it's being monitored. And most of the, yeah. the, the, the uh, companies now, you mentioned Nest, and simply safe and ring a lot of these companies that you know have um smoke detectors that are part of the system i put a ring system in here in my home uh about four months ago five months ago and i decided to go with a professional monitoring because i even though i can get an alert on my phone i want to get a call if there's a problem in my yeah. home and so are they know, using a photoelectric heat is Ring using a photoelectric heat? I, I don't know because I, I didn't. I haven't. I haven't bought that yet, but I've seen them. Okay. In the when I picked out my stuff, you know, what you can add, buy, and add to your package. Okay. So I, you can add them in after the fact. But most of them, like you said, like Nest especially, um, have have wanted to provide people with the packages that instead of paying the huge amount you have to pay for. Uh, one of the other the established major corporation systems, you can pay maybe twenty five percent of that, get a system, uh, an alarm system, uh, fire sensors, uh, door sensors, cameras, etc., for a much lower cost. And I've you know I've tested my system a couple of times, and. With, with their permission and notice and it worked great it works great so if you're involved in one of those home security slash uh, alarm systems look into the the fire protection modules that they offer and hopefully if they're the photo cell and heat sensor that's going to be a good one for you to get but we're going to recommend invest in the professional monitoring it's worth the peace of mind and know that you're doing everything you can to keep your family safe. Yeah. And that's what and the, the nest, Steve, the nest, you don't have to, you can, you have the option of doing the monitoring, professional monitoring, as right. you mentioned, 
but you can also monitor it via your cell phone. Yes, that's what I do with Ring. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, but I so, still bought. I still took. I still decided it was worthwhile. We don't have a landline yeah. anymore, yeah. so it was worthwhile to get no be monitor on my. I can monitor on my phone. But I want that if there's a problem, I want them to call me. I want them to know because they can yeah, dispatch. Yeah. If I'm driving, I can't just stop and start dialing 911 and trying to pay attention to the road and describe to the call yeah, taker exactly. the answer. So and a plus, monitoring service, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. Plus, that's a landline uh, where, where Wi Fi, you can't have issues with Wi Fi. Who has it, right? Right. And you might not get the call to your cell phone if the Wi Fi is down. They're, they're working on the cable or whatever, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, but still, overall, the technology is there. It was, it's been there before right. they made that boat. Right. They could right. have licensed the technology. And right. boom. But they didn't. No. no. All right. It, well, it, this it's is not such gross negligence. It's beyond gross negligence. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If, if this Rich, comes Richard out. Richard Patton calls it murder. Yeah. It's... They, they knew. They knew, and they kept making it anyway. Yeah. There's a fine line between negligent homicide and murder, and they crossed the line, yeah. in my yeah. opinion. They crossed yeah. the line. Well, for 50 years. For 50 years. You know, we're fulfilling our, our responsibility in, in sharing this information with the public, uh, with all the firefighters. So they're, they're, uh, they have the information. They know where they can go. And we hope that they will do that that you, our listeners, you, our uh, viewers on YouTube, you will take this information, check, f check it yourself. That's the best way. You Absolutely. follow what you, we give you, the information we've given you. You follow that path, look through it, read the information, and see what, what your stance is once you've been uh, well-informed on your own, by your own research. But we ask, again, please, once you do learn, and if you agree with what we're talking about, then please make sure you share it with everybody and anybody you know who might need to know this information, including the chief of your department, if you're not the chief listening, okay, or the fire prevention officer in your department. Share the knowledge. Let them Give them the information to listen to the or watch the podcast or they, the websites that they can go to to do the learning from there. But that's important. And so for that, I want to thank Dennis Fox for, we've had it postponed once because there was a problem with the system one, uh, the next time I was sick. Dennis, thank you for your patience and hanging in there with me. I, I sincerely appreciate it. This was just too important to let go. Uh, we had to get this information out. I knew that from the very, for our very first conversation, as you mentioned. And I'm glad that we finally put this together today. We're going to get it out. The video will probably be posted by tomorrow and today's Tuesday. So hopefully the audio podcast will be posted by Thursday. Today is Tuesday the 17th. And we hope that this will be a great learning experience for our viewers and listeners. And all thanks to you, Richard, uh, Dennis, for, for doing it. You know, I, I, it's funny because his good friend who he, he's mentioned several times is Richard Patton. We've talked about who just published this first information almost 50 years ago when he re realized it happening plus the buddy my friend my good friend that i met in the fire service still my best friend today is also a richard so i apologize for using that. oh don't forget and my brother yeah my younger brother still a richard but in fact this is dennis fox it's his website you're going to go to we're going to put that in the show notes it's all good it's all, all good. good if it it's... wasn't for richard i wouldn't be here right, right now. right i mean right. No one would have known about this probably if Richard didn't. He he made sacrifices. As a fire protection engineer, he was demoted because of the pressure that the uh, fire insurance groups were putting on uh, a company he was working for as a fire protection engineer. They had to demote him. Uh, because these fire insurance people were manipulating, like they were gonna, they were upset what he was talking increase about. Increase their insurance or something. I, yeah. I forget exactly what. But before he exposed the uh, smoke alarms, he exposed the fire insurance companies. Okay, 
who in 1896 established the part of the fire club that writes codes. Right. Okay. Um, how they kept fire sprinklers out of homes. How many homes have you seen oh, with fire sprinklers? Don't get me started. I, I am yeah, such a no, proponent of the but, National uh, Sprinkler Association, Fire Sprinkler Association, the NFSA. They're doing such great work. They take their trailers all over the country to show you what happens with a home that's non-sprinklered and the home that is sprinklered. Yeah. Um, the costs that you'll hear from builders uh, for new homes, they're going to tell you it's way up in the, of course, based on your square footage, but way up in the five figures to do it when today we can use uh, certain types of pipe that is much less expensive and we, and it can actually be done in the building and even in a retrofit. And I'll tell you something, I have a, I have a, a, a great supporter of this podcast. He's been on multiple times, a, a retired fire chief who has re retrofitted every single home that he's lived in with sprinklers. Yep. Yep. Um, now, and that's something that a lot of us could and maybe should do as well. But right now you have to do the absolute minimum to protect yourself and your family. And that's yeah. have good working, working, smoke detectors and heat detectors in there. So Dennis, my sincere thanks for hanging in there with us, your patience, and for sharing this information with me and with our viewers and listeners. This is imp this was an imperative, without a doubt, and I am so glad that we're finally able to put it together. This is going to save, this podcast is going to save lives. Well, as they Over say, time, from, from your mouth no to God's doubt. ears, right? It's, it's, it's going to, yeah. People who act, people who act, you know, and hopefully sign the petition and share that petition. Make a comment, too, because it doesn't seem like the attorney generals are in any hurry. Right. I, I posted the uh, consumer complaint over two months ago. Yeah. And that's, right. well, and, we'll you know, like, some we'll of them just them. passed it off to the fire club to deal with. And then there's still about 89% who have not informed me one way or the other. If they're, you know, they're very secretive yeah. about, you know, they're doing, some of them are doing their research and seeing if they can even, you know, act. Right, right. They, yeah, they can't sue government agencies, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. But they can go after the manufacturers and. Sure. So, sure. anyhow, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much. I consider you not only a, you know, person who's supporting this effort, but a friend. Thank you. A Thank you. That friend. means a lot. All right, folks, if you're watching the video, this is going to be the end. If you're listening to the audio, well, you know what's going to happen. We're going to take a pause. We'll have a few words, and then we'll be right back right after those words. But to those of you watching, thank you very much for your patronage. We really appreciate you joining us on YouTube, leaving a comment. And also, by the way, don't forget to leave constructive criticism. We want to make sure we're bringing you the programming that you want to hear and see. Thanks again. To those of you listening on the audio, we'll be right back. To those of you in the video, thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Until next time. Bye-bye.